Want to start investing in Pokemon cards, but not sure where to start? Today's video is for you. All right, hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Power Sports and Rebellious Show. I'm your host, Matt Powers. Thank you again for joining me. If you guys can, please visit the website, powersportsandrebellious.com. Also, give me a follow over there on Instagram, at Powers Autographs. If you like this video, like this channel, please feel free to like and subscribe. I definitely always, always appreciate it. Well, I have a very, very special guest for you guys today here. This was a super fun interview. Uh, I really hope you guys are going to get a lot out of this. Uh, Jeremy is a, a, a very awesome storyteller, a Pokemon collector, and a Pokemon expert. And I really hope you guys get a lot of value here about how to start your Pokemon collection and maybe some do's and some don'ts there. At the end of the video, you got to stick around for this one. He shares this epic air card. Uh, it is absolutely phenomenal. I'll give you a hint. It's of two of the greatest players of all time. Absolutely epic. You want to stick around to the end of the video here. But let's go ahead and jump on into the interview and learn about some Pokemon cards. Well, hey. Thanks again for coming on, man. I always I appreciate when people take the time out of their busy schedule to join me. So thank you again. I definitely appreciate it. Oh man, my pleasure. I uh, I'm a fan and I'm excited to talk to you. Well, good deal. Well, let's, I'm gonna tell everybody first off where they can find you at. If you're on Instagram at Jeremy Jeremy Padauer, and then you're also on Twitter at JeremyCom. Yeah. And believe it or not, you actually have your own website, which is Jeremy.com, which I found insane that you actually have your first name for a website. Yes, yes. It goes way back, man. I, uh, I started acquiring domain names in the mid-90s. Long story short, um, I was a law student that did not like the idea or the practice of law, and I had to figure out ways to earn money. So I did it by hustling domain names and by creating websites and gaming Yahoo, because Yahoo was nothing more than an alphabetical search engine. That was their algorithm. So I would name websites with two A's or three A's and show up first on their uh, listings. So all these years later, I still have some residue, including my uh, Jeremy.com domain name. <laughs> well, b before we get started, I want to hear about your biggest domain sale. I'm sure everybody would love to hear this story. Oh, sure. Sure. So, gosh, in 1997, I believe, I was uh, looking on uh, Yahoo's uh, classifieds section, of all things. And uh, I was 23 years old. And someone had listed act.com for $1,000. So I reached out to them and I said, sold. And they said, great. And uh, about three hours later, I reached out to remit payment. And they said, sorry, we sold it to someone else. And I was like, uh, that's not the way these things work. And by the way, I'm a second year law student. Don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> sure, well, they took you seriously. Oh, uh, yeah. They took me so seriously that they sold it to someone else. And um, long and short of it is, I intervened uh, as, as a dutiful little hustling guy and uh, ultimately got the information of the other buyer, reached out to that guy, and we uh, decided to go at it together 50-50. And we sold it uh, a little over a year later for $500,000, a 500 times return. And, and I'll tell you one more thing. I'm 24 years old. I get a phone call from Symantec the creators of Act Scheduling Software, and they say, you know, Mr. Padauer, we'd like to offer you $300,000 for your domain name, act.com. And I said, nah, no thanks. <laughs> I mean, here you are living in a, uh, what'd you say, a $300 apartment, and yeah. somebody offered you $300,000 in 1997 or 98? Yes, yes I'm living in a, in a $315 apartment that is akin to the worst place that you would ever want to live. And, but I was so sure of myself and I was so sure that, you know, and by the way, when you're 24 and something like that happens, it seems like it might be the type of thing that happens to people. You don't realize how unusual that is until you've got a little bit more seasoning under your belt. So it's easier to say no when you don't know much. And so I said no. And then they called me back a few hours later and they offered 500 grand and I was like, that'll do it. <laughs> I, you know, I'm shocked they called back a couple hours later because I would be sweating those hours. You know, did I make the right decision? Did I not? Definitely. I, I, I didn't sweat it. And, you know, it's, it's not my nature not to think about things. But I think I was so sure that that, that was of pretty 
meaningful value um, that something positive was going to happen or I'd convince myself. That's, by the way, that's one of the problems with entrepreneurialism in general. Sometimes you get so sure of yourself that you don't see what reality is. And that's been one of the things that I've tried to shape as an entrepreneur throughout my life, that no matter how good something feels, to always be realistic, because what you don't want to do is put yourself on the line to the extent just because you happen to be a dreamer. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that's just uh, attributable to any entrepreneur. So I think maybe the, the, the irony is today as an adult, you know, having been through a lot of entrepreneurial moments, um, I could say no to that because I don't need it. Uh, at the time I needed it a lot. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the, with the lack of clarity of thought that that kid had at that time. <laughs> Well, you know what? What people are looking for some clarity on some thought is Pokemon cards, sure. which you are, uh, you know, what I've gathered in my studies of this is I would consider you to be an expert in it. You, you know, you've just recently uh, bought what $135,000 collection of the first edition, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And you've got, you're a sports car collector too. Yeah. So tell us a little bit, you know, I've heard you say Pokemon changed your life. Talk a little bit about your connection to Pokemon. Sure. And why this brand is so uh, so important and relevant now. So I started working with Pokemon in 2006 when in my capacity as an executive in a toy company, we won the rights to manufacture Pokemon toys and collectibles globally. So Hasbro had it before. And, um, you know, the phenomenon of Pokemon in the late 90s was beyond anyone's wildest expectations. But once you got into the 2000s, and especially the mid-2000s, it had simmered down a bit, and especially on the toy side. The car side was always great, but the toy side had simmered down. And Hasbro was exiting, and we swept in, and a six-year-old brand in the U.S., we jumped in and, and got the rights, and, we, and we, we developed very strongly under those rights and grew the business like a 1,000% within like a year. Uh, and... When, in 2016, now cut to 10 years later, I had created my own uh, toy company with, with two wonderful partners um, years before in 2013. And uh, I had the opportunity to pitch for the global rights once again outside of Asia. And when we pitched for it, um, Pokemon was very impressed and, we, and they actually Un, an unusual situation. They they made a capital investment into our organization, to our company. So we became true business partners with Pokemon and the toy company. So uh, last year, um, we sold uh, the company to Allegheny Capital Corporation, and uh, and myself and my two business partners have stayed on to a combined entity called Jazzwares, which is now one of the top ten toy companies in the world, and we continue to be the Pokemon partner. So that's my Pokemon professional experience. On a collector side, I've, I'm a lifelong collector, and I've been tracking Pokemon valuations for the last, you know, you know, 15 years. And I've seen the first edition Charizard go from a $500 card in 2006 you know, uh, to a $30,000 card in 2017, 16, 17, to a $250,000 card today. Um, and uh, my own investment in Pokemon uh, was after the sale of the organization, um, I knew that we would continue to be the Pokemon licensee globally, and I knew that I'd be deeply involved in the organization. But I felt such a debt of gratitude, and I understood the market so well that I started analyzing the first edition set because I knew that was the great entry point into Pokemon, 1999 first edition set. And I did a spreadsheet as I'm a pretty transactional, analytical-minded person. And when I laid out all 103 cards, including the red and, and yellow cheek Pikachu card, I recognized that the set was, you know, a couple, two, 200, maybe $250,000 set at the latest sales prices. And then I identified that one was on the market for $160,000. So I offered 125 and we settled on 129. And, but I knew that right off the bat, that this set was worth probably twice what I paid. And so I went online and I started tracking valuations publicly just to say, hey, look, it doesn't look like anybody's doing this. And then here we are, um, you know, a little more than eight months later or something. 
And that set that I bought for 129 is probably a $700,000 set, maybe a little bit more. But it wasn't just the it wasn't just my investment there. I I put a million dollars into Pokemon uh, before this latest collector boom. Wow. And the reason why I did that, like I said, is because I feel a lifelong indebtedness to the brand, but I also understand it from an investment collectible standpoint. So there were several areas that I focused on in terms of investing beyond the first edition set. And I'd be happy to take you through those areas today and as, as, as well as any other thing that you'd like to talk about. But Yeah, I think that, you know, people like myself who are into autographs, and I know you're into autographs too, but well, well, I deal mainly yeah. with autographs and sports cards and a lot of my listeners and followers are all of a sudden hearing about all these Pokemon cards. And yes. maybe they watched it as a kid. Maybe they didn't. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the Pokemon <laughs> cards. Was that? <laughs> so why is it so big? All right. So here's, here's the reason. So psychologically follow this line of thought. So Pokemon came to the States in 1999. Okay. And they launched their first edition cards at that time. At that time, the average Pokemon consumer was 6 to 12 years old. Okay. And when you're six to 12 years old, you play. That's what you do for a living. You love to play. And all of those kids in 1999 were playing Pokemon. They were crazily into Pokemon. We'll cut to 21 years later. Those kids are between the ages of 27 and 33 years old. And the question is, when you're looking at a platform and you're looking at the investability of a platform, is there a market? Well, the, so is there a market? Well, we know that those kids were involved at the time. Are they still involved? And one stat just stands out more than any other to me, and that is the second largest retail entertainment brand of all time is Star Wars. In the last 43 years, since 1977, Star Wars has done about 60 to $65 billion at retail in, in consumer goods, okay? Wow. That's around $1.25 billion a year in consumer goods. Pokemon came out of Japan started in Japan in 1995, 1996. And in 24-25 years, Pokemon is the number one retail brand of all time, having done over $100 billion at retail. So while Star Wars has been averaging about 1.25 to maybe 1.33 billion a year, Pokemon has averaged more like 4 billion a year. Wow. So you can imagine how excited from a professional standpoint I've been to be aligned to them. They've been amazing. It's not a mistake that they're this good. They're an amazingly well-run company. Um, but from a collector standpoint, this 27 to 33 year old has had a lifelong experience with Pokemon. The second question is, is there a platform of collectability? And yes, cards is the phenomenal platform of collectability. And then the third question is, what about scarcity and how do you measure it? And scarcity within the Pokemon universe is pretty easily measured when you have things like PSA and BGS grading these cards, much like the sports cards universe. Um, the difference between Pokemon and sports cards is, I, as I said, Pokemon is a very well-run company. And so when they're out and they're de developing their long-term plan, none of their plan is to overproduce or manufacture. They know their market exceptionally well. Their, their analytics are over the top. Mm -hmm. They are... To me, as a collector, and I'm not talking professional, I'm talking to a collector, it's just a great bet for me to invest in something that I see has all of those elements. Awareness, uh, a consumer base that's of age and, and becoming older. And by the way, that 27 to 33-year-old today, the psychology of it is they've got some capital and they can influence capital, but they're not in this full stride in their career. I mean, not even the best of the best are in the full stride of their career at 27 years old. But give it another 10 years, give it another 15 years, and come back and check in on this market. And even though you've seen an explosion of growth today, I can tell you firsthand that a lot happens between 27 and 42, and <laughs> between 42 and 47, right? right? You evolve, you become a serious business person. And um, I will be uh, shocked, uh, in my opinion, if you don't see these card values continue to rocket over the next 10, 15 years. So let's take, let's take someone like myself who knows about sports cards, but knows nothing about Pokemon. Let's talk some of the basics about Pokemon cards. We've got common cards. We've got uncommon cards. We've got rare cards. Break yeah. that down simply for the, the listener at home who can understand what these cards actually mean. Yeah, sure. Well, so essentially when it comes to Pokemon, there's levels of rarity. 
for sure. And I think you've identified that. The the rarest cards are the hollow cards, the holographic cards. They're the shiny, shiny candy, right? And what you'll see is those cards uh, have the lowest population reports, especially in the vintage items. Uh, and I primarily focus on 1995 to 2000. Um, that's the inception. That would be roughly like focusing in on the 52 tops, baseball, um, 51 Bowman, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like, it's like focusing on the, the, uh, 86, 87 Fleer basketball and the, and then the, the, the few sets that, that preceded it. Um, the, the rare hollow cards are, are the rarest. And then there are rare cards, which have a lower population report, maybe slightly higher than the hollows. And then the uncommon cards, which are a little bit less rare than rare. And then the common cards, where you will find more of the common cards per pack than any of the others. And in terms of the rarity, that tends to follow the history of the Pokemon line. You talked, actually, I believe yesterday on an Instagram post about the Michael Jordan and LeBron James of Pokemon cards. Uh, I've been talking to my listeners about this forever and ever and ever about you know, everybody yeah. likes collecting rookies. Don't get me wrong. They get yeah. exciting when they when they have, a you know, the ceiling so high, the profit margins can be high, but you also, 99% of them don't make, no, don't pan out. So I've been telling people, let's invest in the, like, people that are, you know, actually real stars right now. So who are, like, the real stars as far as the characters? The LeBrons and the Michael Jordans of Pokemon yeah. cards. So it's interesting. And so I'm going to, I don't, I don't want to put off any of, of your listeners, uh, but... I see LeBron as catching up to Jordan year to year, uh, right? Jordan is standalone, the greatest scorer, and at the very top of the defensive uh, stats in the history of basketball. Uh, LeBron is an all-around athlete, has certain size attributes that allow LeBron to perhaps be maybe uh, the all-around, uh, maybe not the greatest in any particular category, but the all-around greatest possibly at the end of a career. There's still five, seven years to determine that. Right. But when you look at Pokemon, what I would say is the LeBron and Jordan um, are Charizard, which Charizard is like the most powerful Pokemon and very rare because Charizard tends to be a hollow card. Uh, and especially in the first edition, uh, Charizard is a holographic card, card number four, I believe. And it is, uh, I think the total pop report of PSA 10 is 120. I think the, the average valuation of those cards today would be, like I said, 250 plus. Um, the other would be Pikachu. And interestingly enough, Pikachu uh, in the earliest sets was a common card. Hmm. Uh, but Pikachu is the icon. So you have Pikachu being the icon and you have Charizard being the most powerful. Um, and those two cards, I think, over the course of time will continue to outperform simply because who and what they are. And if you were looking at additional cards, there are starter cards, like the, like the, every generation of Pokemon that tends to come out every three years or so has three particular starters that, that like, that are at the very top of, I would say the collectible ladder. Um, but anything that falls into hollow and rare um, also, by and far, are, are, tr are tremendously collectible. So you talked a little bit about sports cards, about, you know, 52 tops and yeah, the 86 Fleer for Jordan. Are there any particular eras or sets for Pokemon that are as iconic as those ones are? Yeah, so for me, I've focused on five collectible types, okay? And they're all vintage. Um, but this isn't necessarily everyone's strategy. It's just mine. So number one is the 1999 launch set. And I focused on the first edition, but also there's Shadowless and also the Unlimited base set. Uh, I would just say, go educate yourself on those three types. But that 1999 set has escalated tremendously in value. I think it will only continue to, in my opinion. Number two is the 1996 original trading card game, Japanese set. OK, and the individual cards within that set trade at somewhere between one fifth to one twentieth the price of the ninety nine set, despite this, despite the fact that the population reports are similar and despite the fact that those are truly the OG cards. 
they just were not historically adopted into the community because remember, you're talking about six to 12 year olds who are re-engaging with their cards and who may not have been even aware of the Japanese style cards that preceded them. Okay, so now they're 30 and they're going, oh my gosh, these Japanese cards are amazing, right? <laughs> and the valuation has lagged behind. And I believe over the course of time, those original 1996 Japanese cards will only continue to outperform. Um, yes. I, sorry, I, I saw that they had different cards in different languages. Like they've had Spanish cards and, of course, Japanese cards, English cards. Are there any language that's worth more than any other ones? Or is it just depending on the year? Yeah, I mean, to me, it's you can simplify this a lot by saying, yes, in 1999, they launched with a bunch of different languages uh, because they were doing their global launch in terms of the collector card game. And um, the English language is the premium language of that particular era, although you can find some great bargains in various languages around the world. And I think that collecting into those languages is, is a pretty good idea, especially with the key characters. Um, but the 96 original OG trading card game is, I think that's the inception. I, 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 I've put my money where my mouth is, and I've focused a lot on the 96 set. Um, the third area that I would say is one year prior to that, there was something called the Top Sun set in 1995. Now, it's interesting because it's the very first cards ever in the Pokemon world. They, the deal was made prior to the 96 trading card game, apparently, but they didn't get distributed until after. So they have a copyright of 1995, which are the very, very first cards within the range. So the 1995 cards are very primitive and very cool, and they're not trading cards. They're collector cards. So there was no game associated with it. So I like those cards a lot. Uh, the fourth uh, uh, set that I would say is really less of a set and more of, of an affinity towards Charizard and Pikachu. Anything between 1995 and 1999, Charizard and Pikachu, whether it's Top Sun or Bandai or Cardus or Mayhi or any of the sub any of the brands that launched during those times that were in and out, I don't think you can go wrong with Pikachu and Charizard. And then the fifth area of collectability for me is one that's very rare and very special. It's the 1999 Trainer Deck A and B cards. These are exactly the same as the traditional 1999 cards, but they were distributed to card shops ahead of the launch of Pokemon so that kids could learn how to play. And instead of having a blue back, they have a red back. And these cards were beat to death, so they're exceptionally rare. I, I actually have only one of two complete PSA 10 sets of the B cards, and there's never been a PSA 10 complete set of the A cards, or at least today there's not one. And I think I have like the second best set and I have like nine A's and four B's or something like that. So the trainer deck A and B cards, I think one day will be heralded as maybe some of the most valuable, even though today they're not. Um, so those five areas of collectability, I think are, uh, from a vintage Pokemon collecting standpoint, I think that's where I absolutely have put a lot of time and money and effort. Do you think learning the Pokemon game is, is a benefit to collectors and investors? I mean, I think it's, it's always good to have an awareness for why things are the way they are. Um, but I think that you don't have to be a player of the game to fully understand why certain things are valuable and other things are not. I think that if you're, a, if you're aware and a fan of collectible systems in general, um, it's not very difficult to understand why a collectible system from an economic standpoint works. But what I would say is if you really are gonna go drop some money on Pokemon, go watch a, a, an episode of you know one of the old vintage episodes from the original series um go watch a youtube channel and watch a couple videos of kids playing just so that you can have a sense for what the interaction is and and it might help you with some insight as to the psychology of it all you and you talked a little bit about 
you know, how in sports cards, they're kind of handed down from generation to generation. Yes. You know? Do you see Pokemon cards getting to that level at all? Absolutely. I mean, I think the starting point here is just recognizing that and I can't say this with a certainty, but I'm almost sure that this is the case, that Pokemon has done more retail business from a trading card standpoint in the last 25 years than all sports cards combined. I mean, I don't think wow. that, I, yeah, I, and I'm pretty sure that that's the case, and it may be a multiple of it, because I don't think that you can get to $100 billion or even close when you add it all up. So the engagement with the consumer base is way more broad. And by the way, the po to be fair, the Pokemon number is a total retail number. It's not just a card number. But still, I stand behind my opinion is that the Pokemon business is probably greater than all of those businesses combined. I can't say that with absolute certainty, but I would be interested in someone showing me that I'm wrong. Um, so with that said, what you have right now with sports cards, sports cards have been around for a century and a half. And sports card collecting for value has been around for 75 years. You can find old ads for cards that were being sold for more in the secondary market from the 30s and 40s, right? So what I would say to you is there's been a handoff from generation to generation on sports cards. But in Pokemon, we're literally just coming upon the first generational handoff now. These 30-year-olds are having young kids and they're sharing ideas and they're sharing all of this. But now these 30-year-olds just watch Logic sell a Charizard for 220 or buy a Charizard for $220,000. I just think that what you're going to see over the course of time is much like sports cards, if not on a grander scale because of the how well managed the brand is and how big the base of consumers are and how global it is. We're not, I mean, one thing about sports cards is that we tend to be embracing athletes that were American athletes. Uh, Pokemon is a global scale. I mean, there's not a country where you can't find kids that don't know who Pikachu is. So it's, it's just a different scale. So yesterday, as I was kind of going through my YouTube, a video popped up of this guy opening up this $375,000 <laughs> fake box of, yeah. I guess it was supposed to be a first edition. And we, we have the same problem in the sports card industry. It's not unique to Pokemon, but can you maybe give some tips or some ways to people to avoid maybe getting, you know, fake packs and fake Pokemon cards? Yeah. Yeah. I don't buy uh, sealed boxes of cards. What I will buy is a box of cards where the individual packs are sealed, <clears throat> weighed, and if I'm going to spend $200,000 on a box, right, um, I'm going to treat that box like it's a house. I, I want a full inspection. And right. if I have to pay $1,000 to have that done, I'm going to do that. Uh, a, a seal on a box that looks like the original manufacturer seal is way too easily replicated. Uh, for me to feel a level of comfort, especially if my objective is to keep that thing sealed. Like, so what? I find out 10 years later that I, the box I paid $200,000 for that's $2 million was fake. Like, who do I go back against? Nobody. Everyone's gone. So <clears throat> I personally don't recommend buying sealed boxes of that level unless you have every single pack inspected. And um, I I frankly don't even know. I mean, I know B B Baseball Card Exchange uh, will do stuff like that with uh, baseball and sports boxes, but they don't do it with Pokemon. Um, so before you spend that kind of money on a Pokemon box, either you have to feel extremely confident about the history of that box, and I mean extremely confident, or you have to um, work somehow, and by the way, maybe this is a business opportunity, with a third party that is willing to weigh, write down pack to pack, and put it back in the box, seal it, and even put like a hologram on it. Whatever it takes, what I'm saying is um, buyer beware. When it comes to that kind of money, you find players who are not necessarily acting with your interest at heart.
Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Well, they got new authentication companies, it seems like, every day. They got what WADA that does the video games now. And I definitely agree that is an opportunity. And, you know, our industry, the autographs, which you know this as well, is yes. authenticity is just paramount. I just did a video on this about, you know, while the hologram in the, the sports card industry or sports industry, the autograph industry is great for now. Yeah. I still think we're lagging way behind on authenticity there. There needs to be oh. some sort of picture of your exact item on a website because people can just take those holograms off. And it's just it's a big, big problem. And I, it's 2020. I feel like if, if we've been to the moon already, I feel like we can we can get yeah. this or allegedly, I guess, to, to some yeah. people, you know, I mean, look, it, it absolutely. It's an easily solvable problem. It's a business opportunity. And um, I, I'm sure that we'll blink. And there'll be someone, you know, providing a utility that will allow us to fulfill that. But yeah, no, we live in a world where people can replicate masterpieces of artwork that are 700 years old that require experts to look at it under a microscope to go, this isn't real. Um, how hard is it to put fake cellophane in, on a box? Uh, I mean, come on. So um, we just have to be very, you know, diligent, uh, diligent about the way... Uh, sorry vi vigilant <laughs> uh about the way we um about the way we study our our collectibles and i saw something too that you know i guess logan paul the youtuber he yes. i guess he was buying some big card for two hundred and twenty five thousand or or half quarter million or something like that and i guess it ended up turning out being fake too or whatnot i don't know what the nah. story was of that no nah, that was all staged it's all staged uh, okay actually, logan and i are friendly and um oh really nice I, yeah yeah, I saw a video of um, of this kid who claimed that he had a Pikachu Illustrator card. I saw and, it on TikTok or something like that. Huh? Yes, yeah. yes, and it was it wasn't all that convincing. But when I saw it, I was like, you know what? If this kid really did find an Illustrator card, I want this kid to reach out to me because I know that I don't want anything. I've I've had success in my career. I'm an entrepreneur. I've done well in toys. Da 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 da. I just want people to win. Right? right. So I screamed out for this kid, like, kid, reach out. Don't don't let someone take advantage of you in this situation. Well, as it turns out, this kid is smart as hell and <laughs> knew that he could gain a little social clout by doing something. And I don't know if Logan saw my, you know, we follow each other. So I don't know if he saw my post about it or not or whether he had already known this kid. But I reached out. Uh, I put a second post out and then Logan and I started texting back and forth. And he's like, dude. He was like, watch, watch this video that I put out in about five minutes. Oh, in the meantime, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, but it, you know what? I'm telling you, man. One thing I've learned about Logan, he is uh, a methodical, smart dude. Like, these types of personalities can form in one of two ways. Either it's total chaos and it's fascinating to watch, or the person's actually super duper smart and well thought out. And just having fun. And he falls under that second category. So really smart dude. So I know our people at home are, are probably thinking about this in the back of their head. And I just kind of popped in my head here. When you're going out and buying a 100000 or $200,000 uh, card or set or something like that, share as much information as you feel comfortable with. But how does that process go through? I mean, are you flying out there with a cash in hand? or I mean, how, how is this working at that level of collecting well maybe so it it really depends it it depends on how good the um transaction uh, it, the platform of transaction is or how credible the seller is and i tend to only make bets that i'm willing to lose a hundred percent of if i'm not either dealing with an intermediary like an ebay where i see that they've had a thousand transactions or if I'm dealing with like a known card shop that, you know, is doing stuff fully insured. Um, but there are ways to protect yourself. Uh, number one, certainly when it, something like eBay, um, you know not to buy from a seller that has zero transactions and, and no other ways to substantiate who they are. And they've got a $200,000 item that should be selling for $300,000. You're not gonna fall for that. Don't get lured into that just because you see an, an amazing deal. And it's tempting, right? Because you're like, oh my God, 
well, maybe they do have to take a discount because people don't know who they are yet. You know, eh, generally speaking, things are what they are, right? Um, but, you know, thousands of transactions, hundreds of transactions, they're all positive, shrouded under the eBay banner. Um, there are some levels of uh, protection there. Um, or if you're buying directly from someone, Instagram or some other level, um, you can do PayPal, friends, and uh, you can do PayPal goods and services, right. which tends to have a level of protection. Um, you could use escrow.com or a third party escrow service that doesn't release the money until you have the goods in your hands. Um, but, or if you're dealing with a card shop or a place of business, you can see their Better Business Bureau background. You can really get a sense as to whether they're real or not. But there are certainly many ways that you can protect yourself. Uh, if you're doing a transaction that doesn't fall into any of those categories, you probably just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no dark alley deals when you're first getting involved in Pokemon cards. No, I mean, look, if someone wants to do a deal in person where you're able to inspect the card itself in the, the slab to make sure that it's real and and you feel like you know enough, um, that that can be also a reasonable uh, way to do business. Um, but you, you probably want to be a little bit more sophisticated before you start making those types of decisions. So if somebody's watching this and they're like, okay, Jeremy, man, you've like, you've convinced me, man. I, I'm excited about Pokemon. I want to get started, but I've got maybe 500 or a thousand bucks, right? You know, a decent amount of chunk of change to get started. Yep. If you were in their shoes, what would you tell them to invest in, uh, for their first time dealing in Pokemon cards? Yeah, I would say um, I would say go to the 1999 Shadowless set, not the first edition, Shadowless. It's right in between first edition and the unlimited set. And see if you can't find a Yellow Cheeks Pikachu for a thousand bucks. Because the first edition Pikachu, which has a very similar pop report, is like seven or eight times more expensive and valuable. And the Shadowless card is under undervalued. Um, alternatively, I would say, look at that 1995 to 1999 time range, uh, and look at, uh, one of the two Charizard or Pikachu, or look at one of the starters and, and there are some gems of value that you can still find in 95 to 99 that fall into those secondary companies, Top Sun, Cardus, Sildus, Mayhe, et cetera. And just buy a great character that's a low pop and a high grade. And, uh, and I have a feeling that, you know, people are mapping this out very well now. It's interesting. Once you get, like, cross collectors into a category like sports card collectors or people who just collect in general and finding this very enjoyable, um, the mapping out the, the universe happens very, very swiftly. You know, whereas... At one point, if it was everyone was just interested in the 99 English, um, that goes out the window when more when when cross collectors come in that don't necessarily just have an emotional attachment to that set. So that that that's what I would say. Did you happen to bring any any fun things that we could see today? <laughs> you know, you know, I didn't, but I could if you give me a couple of minutes. If you want to, if you want to uh, uh, do a hard cut. And I can show you a couple of fun things. So, um, yeah. So, you know what? I, I do have some cool stuff to show you today. Um, I'll show you a few things from Pokemon. And then I'll show you a couple uh, amazing, fascinating sports cards. How about oh, that? Man. All right. Sounds good. All right. So, let's start. You know, one of the things that I mentioned. Well, let's just start with one of the grails. With one of the grails of Pokemon. Right? And that is the, the first edition Charizard PSA 10. And let me make sure I hold this so the light doesn't shine. You Perfect. can see that's a that's the PSA 10 Zard, and it's the first edition here. You see first edition, and it's shadowless, so there's no shadows on the sides here. And this is you know this is one of the this is definitely one of the grails of Pokemon. It's um, you know somewhere between maybe 250 to 300 thousand dollars now. Uh, oh, that's wow. just an estimate. I mean, what's the PSA pop report on something like that? One twenty. Wow. One twenty. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty meaningfully sized pop report. 
Um, and you know, Logic bought his for two twenty. There hasn't been any transactions since uh, because people are just not. They're just not letting them go. You know, they're ex they're ex exceptionally um, um, well held. How, how, as far as that car goes, are there are there new ones that are graded coming on the market much, or is this one that just does not get graded as a ten there's, anymore? The only one, that, well, I, I don't think there's been a new ten in 2020. I don't wow. think. Um, and the only one that I'm aware of that's on the market right now is like four hundred thousand dollars. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend paying that much, but it's a, it's a, a hell of a good card. Um, the other thing that I mentioned to you was the 1999 Trainer Deck cards with the red back. So uh, originally, well, I'll show you the card first, but this is a one of seven uh, Machamp. And um, this is like the, one of the rarest cards within this. this is a population of seven. Uh, <laughs> and this is a PSA 10. And what you'll see is on the back, it's red and it says Trainer Deck. So you'll see this says Trainer Deck. And this was, the reason why it's so rare is A, there weren't that many manufactured. But B, the ones that were manufactured were beat up in the process of these card shops. And what the card shops would get are these decks. So you see this is a trainer deck A and a trainer deck B. So these are the complete decks that the card shop would get. There are very, very few of these around. Wow. I think the trainer deck A sells unopened, I would say, probably at least 20 grand, maybe a little bit more. And the B is maybe over 10 at this point in time. And what's the difference between the A and the B? Just the cards that are inside. So they're, they're, the cards that are inside, the A decks tend to be a little bit more rare for reasons that uh, uh, escape me, but I've heard that the uh, A decks were misplaced. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, you know, I can't, I, I can't absolutely uh, be certain about that. Um, and then the next thing I talked to you about, Top Sun, the 1995 cards. Well, I'm going to show you four Pikachus. Uh, number one, and I believe the, the pop report on this hollow card, the P Pikachu hollow from, is uh, about 16, and that's a PSA 10. It's uh, a beautiful card. It's a beautiful card. It's like I said, it's not a game. It's just a, it's just a trading card. There's no game to it yet. That's the hollow, and then the greenback Pikachu, and what makes it a greenback? is that the greenback, and I believe this is a population of around 20, something like that. And then the blue back, which is a little bit more rare, I think this is like 14 or 16 pop. And the only difference between this and the greenback is the blue. And then I have a very, very special card to show you today, because this could very well be the very first Pikachu ever made. And it's, uh, first of all, let me show you the blue back with the number on top. So do you see the number here? You see there's a number? Yeah. 25? Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So the very first Pikachu or Top Sun cards that came off came off with no number. So there's no number. So this is the uh -huh. first edition, first card of Pikachu. It's a population of one. <laughs> it's the only one. And it's the very first Pikachu and uh, this card is a is a Grail Grail card for sure. Now, do do you have kids at all? I do. I have a do, thirteen year old and eleven year old. Do, do you see yourself with these you know uber expensive cards that you have? Do you see yourself selling these down the road, or is this stuff that you've kind of planned out in your head that you want to keep for them? What's what's your process with that? Well, look, the process goes like this: a they go, generally speaking, they go to a a, a bank vault where essentially I store, you know, a case. Um, and if you have high-end collectibles, I do recommend you keep them in a, in a third-party vault just because um, shit happens. Excuse my language. Well, I, and I think I, my buddy, it was just on yesterday. We just did a video about this. My buddy, David, who's in the insurance business. And yeah. it's, I think it's actually cheaper if you do that because you're yeah. not taking it in and out and doing all this crazy stuff. So there's less, there's less risk of something happening to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then B, I think, uh, I think that uh, one day, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, not to be morbid, but I don't want to pass away and not see the results of my life's collecting, you know, I, I'll, I'm 47. I, I'm guessing in my 60s at some point where I can still enjoy it. 
um, I will do some sort of auction where it's like the Padauer Pokemon auction or something like that. But, you know, I mean, the truth is it's so far out. Maybe it's 15 years. Maybe it's 20. But, like... You better pick up that URL right now. Padauer Pokemon. (laughs) (laughs) Don't don't search for it, though, because then somebody might buy it on there. I think there's a little scam they run there. You buy it, you go back to go buy it, and it's more expensive. Yeah, I can tell you right now that 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 domain name has zero value. So (laughs) even even if I ever did it, it would have... that, That name has no value whatsoever. But, um... But yeah, I mean, like I can see myself doing that, um, but uh, not for quite some time. I don't plan on making any Pokemon sales during my professional career. That's for sure. I mean, as a partner of Pokemon, you know, I I uh, I, I like acquiring. I don't like selling. Good. Um, but I'll show you a couple sports cards that I think you'll dig. Sure. One might actually completely blow your mind. So I think actually they're both kind of mind blowing. But uh, but I'll save I'll save. The basketball one for last. How about that? All right. So here, this is a special card. And it is special for one particular reason. So who are the golf goats? Who are the greatest of all time in golf? You got Nicholas, Palmer, Tiger. Uh, you but know, those kind of guys. narrow it down to two. If I had to narrow it down to two. Oh, probably Palmer and Nicholas would be would my be my top two. Uh, okay. Tiger would be up there too, but he's kind of falling off a little bit, but those would be my top two. So this is a 1973 Panini, Jack Nicholas PSA 10. There's only three of these. It's his true rookie. And uh, I think it's a shocking, shocking card to have. There was I'm just- sur- I'm yeah. surprised you had that considering you, you call yourself not a very good golfer. I'm a terrible golfer. In fact, <laughs> I'm the worst golfer that ever- lived um (laughs) but i have the entire nicholas collection because i think that jack first of all i think tiger is uh right up there um and what he did winning the masters recently um was exceptional and shocking but i i think that jack is um if he's not one of the two goats he's the goat and i had had no idea that panini even made golf cards in the 70s i mean that's incredible 1973 the year of my birth uh they made that card wow and now the next card i'm going to show you as a basketball fan might absolutely positively blow your mind so you mentioned uh jordan and braun right and there's a reason you mentioned those two because um there's a few other guys that fall close to that category, if not in that category. But Jordan and Braun, it's the argument now. It's going to be the argument for, from here on out. But I have something that's going to blow you away because LeBron's very first year, okay? So this is a LeBron James card, okay? But they mislabeled it with Michael Jordan's name. Oh, jeez. So this is a one-of-one one error <laughs> that I have never seen. It's a That's Jordan. Incredible. It's a Jordan rookie. I'm sorry. It's a Braun rookie, right, right. and it's Jordan's last, just after his last year. And somehow they have the same number. And then on the back, let's see LeBron, young LeBron. Right. On the back, please tell me it's Jordan. Ah! <laughs> Jordan. So in my mind, and I can't say for sure. Don't ever say that. In my mind, this is the greatest error card of <laughs> all time. Like, I don't think there's an error card better than this. I can't imagine that there could possibly be. What it's could it be? Yeah. It's, I mean, it's authenticated by, uh, it's authenticated by Beckett, and it's also uh, Upper Deck authenticated. And what did, uh, did Beckett actually grade that card? Uh, th- this is uh, graded authentic. Just authentic, okay. Yeah, because more than a grade, we just wanted – there to be certainty that this thing was absolutely real. Do you, do, you care what, do you care what the grade is on or no? I don't. Yeah, I probably uh, wouldn't actually, yeah. You know what, honestly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a nice card. I mean, you can see the edges are pretty good. The surface is good. But just the fact that it's real and that it exists and nothing like this has ever been found other than this one is like a shock beyond belief. Like, I don't know why this card... I don't know why this card exists, but how did, how did you find it? So 
Um, there was a very, very obscure auction site. And my buddy reached out and said, never heard of this auction. This card is the craziest thing I've ever seen. If it's not real, then what do you have to lose? But, you know, a couple 10,000 bucks. But if it is real, this could be one of the greatest cards ever. It's like, yeah, whatever, let's do it. So um, as it turns out, it's real. And after the auction, the word of it spread a little bit. People really don't know this card exists. Uh, but then, you know, we had a lot of like, what the hell? What is that thing? <laughs> so that is my, that, that is my, uh, that is my like biggest question mark as to what this thing could possibly be one day card, because it's the type of thing that I think if given the right, and I put it back in its thing, but I think if given the right marketing effort and awareness, the fact that you have a LeBron rookie that is juxtaposed, juxtaposed with Jordan right. in this manner, it's, it's just shocking. It's just I, shocking. I know a buyer for you. My boy, Darren Ravel, that I, I'll send this to him when, when the video is done. He's going to be all over that, man. I sure, I sure hope you're not friends with them because you're going to be friends with them real quick. I'm <laughs> he's going to want to have that. <laughs> I'm friends with Darren, and, uh, and I don't know if he's aware of this card or not, but, uh, but I know that uh, it's just an aberration. It's just a crazy, crazy card. Darren, Darren, like you, is very big into one-of-one -one things and obscure things like astronaut stuff and oh, cool. um, just crazy stuff. So if you ever get a chance to talk to him off camera about his collection, it's just it's oh, yeah. incredible. You know we actually, we, we, the last time we corresponded, uh, we, we had a similar conversation, and, uh, and I'm supposed to do that. I, I actually can't wait. Uh, it'll be awesome. You need to do a zoom with him or something like that. He's just, he's just got incredible stuff. So he says Mondays are the best for him. So Darren, if you're watching, man, I'm, I'm plugging you, man. <laughs> Darren is a good dude and, yes. uh, and true, a true like, um, collector's collector. Like he gets it. Oh man. It's, it's, and it's crazy. The amount, not just stuff that he has, but like the, the amount of flack that he takes on social media and he just brushes it off and moves on about his day. And it, I don't think, I think he's kind of like a, uh, I don't want to call Darren a national treasure just yet, but the amount of information that he can share with the public, like stuff that you just like, I never even thought about that. He's just a com walking computer. That guy. Oh, is. no doubt. No doubt. He's a, uh, he's a, he's a true, uh, savant of collecting and of data. But, uh, well, just like you, I mean, I can, I can tell why you guys would hit it off. Oh, for sure. But, um, no, man, this has been a real pleasure. I got to tell you, I'm uh, thrilled, yeah. thrilled to have had this opportunity, and I hear I have two little dogs. Well, one's a big <laughs> dog, and one's a little dog, and they're going buck wild. They want so to go outside, yeah. <laughs> they, they, have, they have communicated to me that as much as I want to continue talking to Matt, that yep, their yep. bladders are now taking priority. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've taken up way more time than I, I probably should have, and I, I, no, I, I, I appreciate you, you doing this. And, I love seeing your stuff out there on Instagram and, of course, YouTube. And I, I, I would encourage you to do more of this stuff because I think you're a really great storyteller. Oh, thank and you can tell that you're authentic in what you do. And I think you're just a personality for the cameraman. So that's just my, my two you. cents for you. I'd, I'd love to see more of your stuff out there. If you had a YouTube channel, oh, my gosh, man. It would be just uh, so much fun to watch. Oh, man. I struggle with it because I don't want to start at zero. I, 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 like, I can't. I don't know if my ego can handle, like I literally just started Instagram and Twitter and it was so hard to start with zero. <laughs> <laughs> you, honestly, of all these social media platforms out there, YouTube is my favorite yeah. because we get to do stuff like this and we get to uh, edit it up and make it fun for people to watch. And you get to start at zero and you get to, you know, get it to where you can get it to. And that's, we talked about that, about, you know, that leap of faith, you know, and I'd rather you, I think you talked about this on somebody's video yeah. about restarting over at 40, you know? Yeah. Can yeah. you do that? Starting you know? business. Starting yeah. business. I mean, you're, I, I don't know. I started at zero and this year I've really developed into the YouTube stuff and I really love doing it. It is my, oh, it is my passion. If I could do this full time, I would. I'll tell you what, man, you're, you are a professional and it comes through and, uh, I can only imagine where you're going, but I'm thrilled that I had the opportunity to be a part of it today. All right. Thanks again, Jeremy, and uh, I will, uh, I'll send you the link when everything's done and edited Thanks. up, man, and, and I appreciate your time today, man. 
Absolutely. I can't wait to share it. Thank you so much, Matt. I, You're welcome. And, and we didn't even talk about autographs. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about autographs next time. We'll do I, another I, video here in the you know in next few months or so. Let me give you a quick uh, a precursor to that. Are you ready okay. for this? Sure. When I was 16 and 17 years old, I wrote a thousand letters to the most uh, accomplished people in the world, and I received almost 200 of them back to the question as wow. to what your greatest accomplishment is. People like Mother Teresa, people like Jimmy Stewart, received these amazing letters back, and I would love to share some of them with you. And we yeah, let's, next time. yeah, absolutely. That is a great, great time. 20% return rate on that? My gosh, that's Take incredible. That. It's amazing what people do for a kid who doesn't know what to do with their life. <laughs> you know what? Sometimes I feel like that too, but uh, I, I definitely get direction from people like you who have made it and, and, and are doing well for themselves. So I appreciate you, Jeremy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I really All right, We'll talk soon, man. Talk soon. Thanks, thanks brother. Thanks, Jeremy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right. Thanks again, guys, for watching. I really hope you enjoyed that interview with Jeremy. Uh, I'll probably bring him on again here, and we'll talk about all those uh, autographs uh, that he had sent off there as a kid there. Those are going to be absolutely epic. Mother Teresa and whatnot. But really hope you guys got some value on the Pokemon cards. Uh, Jeremy's out there on Instagram and Twitter, so if you guys have questions on stuff like that, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer them for you. But... Uh, Jeremy's just a great guy, really just an honor to have him on the show, and I'm really grateful for him to come on here. So again, if you guys like this sort of video, please feel free to share it, like, comment, and uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel as well. I definitely always appreciate it, and uh, visit the website, powersportsmobility.com, and also give me a follow over there on Instagram, at powersautographs. Thanks again, guys, and I'll see you on the next episode.